Well, um, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Klaus Weber. I'm the Deputy Director of the uh, Buffett Institute of Global Affairs at Northwestern. Um, this is part of our uh, Confronting COVID-19 webinar series, um, where we explore a range of different issues related to the current global pandemic. Um, and we've had speakers before that have addressed everything from sort of the historical precedents um, to political governance. Um, uh, we look at some uh, uh, international forms of response and collaboration. Um, today, uh, we're going to look at uh, a very central uh, and a very salient aspect of the pandemic, and that is um, how uh, data uh, and information is conveyed through charts, graphs, and other uh, images. Um, uh, those are all over the news. Um, everyone is focused on them. Everyone interprets them. And uh, we're very fortunate to have um, two real experts in this area. Uh, Jessica Hullman, who's an assistant professor in computer science um, and engineering, and also at Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. Um, and Matthew Kay, who's an assistant professor in the School of Information at Michigan. Uh, Jessica and Matt are really experts in information visualization, and especially around how uncertainty uh, can be conveyed in, in a way that is uh, uh, a good communication and allows people to interpret the data in the right way. Um, so today they, they're going to talk about how to make sense of uh, indeterminate, unreliable, changeable, variable data um, that we're facing with the COVID-19 situation. Um, and so I would like to thank uh, Jessica and Matt very much for joining us today um, to share your knowledge and insight. Um, and um, go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, I think you're good, yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, I wasn't sure if my, my mic is on. Okay, sorry if you just saw me playing with screen share also. <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't too distracting. Um, so thanks for inviting us to do this. We're both really excited. Um, I think, you know, since COVID-19 has come to our attention, people all over the world are looking into infographics and, you know, different visualizations of simulation results being shared online um, to figure out things like, you know, how should I prepare? What precautions should I take? How serious is this, et cetera? Um, and, you know, to just start off um, with why visualizations are powerful here for affecting kind of beliefs and decisions, um, we often talk about the way they offload cognition to perception. So they make it easier for us to do things like identify trends or patterns in data. Um, so here I have a, a, a table of confirmed cases and deaths from coronavirus around the world. Um, I should say that a lot of the visualizations and tables in my slides, like I took screenshots a few days ago, so they're not up to date. So please don't look to them for like up to the minute data. Um, but imagine I have this table and I want to maybe find a couple countries and compare um, their growth rates over time. Um, and so it's going to take me a long time to do that in a table, um, depending on how many countries I have in the table to find the ones that I want will take a while. And then I have to use a lot of kind of mental power or working memory to keep in mind the values as I'm trying to get a sense of trends. Um, when I visualize the data and these computations become much more efficient. Um, so now, um, you know, here I'm seeing coronavirus deaths um, over time by different countries. And so now to find a country, um, you know, I can find that country's label, um, all of the data. So the trend for every country is now um, in a single mark a line um, in this chart. And so I can much more easily make comparisons between countries. Um, we can also do things with the visualization, like transform the data in various ways that makes the visual task easier here um, by taking a log scale, which I'll talk about a little more later. Um, another aspect of visualization that I think is important to note and involves the kind of order in which we, we acquire information when it's visualized versus shown in another format and kind of how much attention we pay to different information. So um, with a table, you know, I'm gonna acquire the information by reading down the rows or looking from left to right across the columns. Whereas in a visualization, I'm gonna acquire the information often um, in proportion to how visually salient it is. And if it's a good visualization, the data values themselves are mapped to the visual attributes of the marks. Um, and so I'm often, my eye's gonna be drawn to the most extreme values. Um, and that can be useful. So here, you know, I might pay attention more to the countries with the highest cases, um, sorry, or the highest deaths, or the most different trends. Um, so uh, with this basic kind of understanding of how visualizations change kind of how we read data, I wanna look at a couple coronavirus visualizations. Um, 
you know, I'm going to start with maps of cases because I've seen a number of these kind of around on the internet. Um, and you probably have too. So in both of these, um, we're seeing um, certain points that draw our attention immediately. Um, places like New York, um, uh, Chicago, other big Midwestern cities, maybe Florida, um, you know, the West Coast, Washington, California, maybe Louisiana. And this is good, I guess, in that there are more cases in these places, um, but there's also a number of issues with the way kind of the visual salience of the marks is communicating the data to us in maps like this. So um, first, both of these maps are plotting a count to a circular area. Um, but we know from graphical perception that people are not very good at making area estimates. So we tend to have um, kind of a lot of error in trying to do things like compare different circular areas. Um, another obvious issue is occlusion. So it's hard for me to see anything kind of around the eastern seaboard because New York's kind of um, uh, occluding a lot of it and these other big city cases are as well. Um, so one way we could try to get rid of the occlusion here is by using something more like a choropleth map, which would color each location, um, perhaps by county, according to the number of cases. So then the darker um, counties will have more cases and our eye will be drawn to those. Um, but there's still issues with a map like this um, in that now the size of the different counties is kind of um, going to confound what we pay attention to. So very densely populated areas are often um, smaller. Uh, in area, um, so they'll leave potentially a smaller visual impression. Um, and this is, these are just kind of trade-offs we face when we're trying to map data to, to um, maps. Um, there's other problems with the original on the left here that a choropleth map won't necessarily solve. So one is that when you're visualizing count data um, involving people in any way, often what you end up with is a population map. Um, so if you look at the one on the left, you know, we're seeing big bubbles where there's a lot of population and that's not super surprising. Um, an obvious solution could be to normalize the data instead. So show the rate per a thousand or a million people. And here's a core plus of, of kind of COVID um, cases per a uh, thousand residents from the New York Times. Um, but there's still gonna be issues here. Um, is that when we have differences in the number of people per county, there's gonna be differences in how reliable these rates are um, that we're looking at. Um, and in particular, when you have a county with a low population, they may, may appear to have more extreme rates, either higher or lower, simply because of sampling error. So sampling error basically refers to the fact that um, when we're trying to take a measurement and we have less people or less sample to take it on, um, uh, our variance is higher or on, our uncertainty is higher. So here, you know, the most dangerous counties on this example map um, are all in kind of the Midwest, and so are the safest counties, and that turns out to be because we don't have many people living there. Um, so we could try to take into account sampling error and visualize that as well in a choropleth map of something like a rate. Um, and while it's hard to add kind of a, an error bar um, or a density plot to some of your, your kind of um, map visualizations, we can use a technique I like to call um, hypothetical outcome plots, where we're going to basically um, uh, animate draws um, from the distribution for each uh, area here. So each state has, um, you know, say a rate that I'm estimating and I have a distribution of that rate and I'm going to take a sample and visualize that uh, the, the value as color. Um, and for each sample, um, the color will change. And so um, with something like this, um, what we notice is that um, you'll see less changes in color where you have a lot of people or a higher sample size. This is obviously not COVID data. Um, and then, you know, states that have a low sample um, will jump around, the color will vary more. So it, it kind of, um, uh, in some ways, kind of changes the sales function. We might want to perhaps um, uh, change this even more so that, um, you know, the, the ones that grab our attention more are the ones that have the most reliable rates, but that's something we can play with. Um, the point is kind of that we've now shown um, sort, of, sort of this uncertainty from sampling error. However, there's a pretty massive problem with all of the maps I just showed, which maybe you've been wondering about, um, which is that they're all showing COVID cases. Um, and we know, um, uh, you know, from um, for a very variety of reasons that experts have been talking about that COVID um, case data is pretty biased. Um, so when you're looking at things like confirmed cases, um, those are likely to be underestimated um, potentially by a lot. Um, so there's been uh, a lack of testing in various places. Um, in most places, I think getting tested means you're somehow already experiencing symptoms. 
Um, and we know from what experts have said that most, um, perhaps people who get COVID will not experience any symptoms. Um, so we're missing some people. And even if you have symptoms getting tested in some countries like the US or the UK has been quite difficult. Um, other countries, it's been easier. So making comparisons between different regions, even different states in the US um, is difficult. Um, uh, and also you might give up, you might never get tested because it's so difficult in some places. Um, there have been countries like Iceland that are doing more um, what we would call random kind of sampling of people, um, uh, but the majority of places are not doing this. And this means that these case um, uh, counts uh, and the rates that we might um, use uh, or compute from them are pretty unreliable. And, you know, we might think that like deaths, so deaths are more certain because when someone dies with COVID, you kind of know. Um, but even here, I think we have to be a little careful in that. If somebody has multiple conditions and they die with COVID, um, you know, I've, I've heard experts talk about how it's hard to say, was it really COVID that killed them? Um, they're also early on potentially say in a place like the US when people were kind of denying community um, transmission, there might be um, have been incentives for certain people to misreport deaths as well. So we just have to be really careful with this data um, is what I'm suggesting. Um, we can visualize growth rates and a lot of visualizations are doing that. Um, uh, because um, one thing that we that we have to take into account is how quickly um, is the disease spreading. Um, so here um, I'm showing two visualizations. Um, you've probably seen some like this. So um, here we're showing uh, basically the the change over time on both of these um, in COVID cases in a couple of countries, Italy and the U.S. Um, and uh, what's kind of interesting here, I think, is that in visualizing these, these growth rates, designers face this question of, do I want to show the rate kind of for what it is, which is an exponential growth rate? Um, you know, do I want people to really see how extreme this looks? Um, uh, or do I want to enable kind of more precise comparisons between the rates in different countries? Um, so on the left, I have a linear scaled chart. This is um, showing, uh, you know, cases um, on the y-axis, um, just on a linear scale. And so the rate of spread in the United States looks kind of similar to Italy, and it's hard to tell, you know, just how much steeper um, is it kind of, you know, uh, around March 19th when, when this chart is um, It's a hard comparison to make. On the other hand, on the right, um, I have, instead of a linear scale, a uh, log scale. And a lot of authors have been doing this as a way to kind of make it easier to compare the rates in different places. So now, um, there is a distortion, so now notice that the same between 10 and 100 as between, say, 10,000 and 100,000. So that's misleading if the reader doesn't get it, but it's also um, much easier to see, for instance, you know, where um, the growth rate started to level off in Italy um, uh, and the fact that that hasn't really happened in the U.S. at, at this time point um, when this graph was made. Um, but even this log scale graph on the right, we could improve in a few more ways. So first we're looking at confirmed cases here, and we've already talked about issues with that. Um, another challenge here, I think, is that we're seeing calendar time on the X axis. Um, but because the virus entered different countries at different times, and you know, because countries are potentially bounded by the size of their population, perhaps how extreme their lockdown efforts are, we can easily end up with situations in this graph on the right where it's hard to compare kind of the point at which the growth slowed in one country to another, um, or hard to compare these trajectories because they're in very different parts of the chart. Um, and so um, here we have an improvement from the Financial Times, where rather than calendar time on the x-axis, we have number of days since the 10th death. Um, so it doesn't matter if COVID appeared in Asian countries significantly before it appeared in Western countries, we can still compare them all. Um, and this is log scaled again on the y axis. And so the slope is going to represent how um, quickly the cases uh, are doubling in this case. And what I like is the authors have kind of added these reference lines here to, to mark off different regions in which the deaths are doubling, say, one to two days or every two to three days, et cetera. And this makes um, some of our, our visual judgments a lot easier because we can just look at like where does the line for a country pass um, into a different region. So it's changed here from for Spain. Um, from one to two days to doubling every two to three days. It's also annotated with important events, like when lockdown occurred at different countries, which kind of helps us, you know, do some causal inference as well, or at least speculate about, um, you know, how lockdown affected these rates. Um, but I think we could even improve this further. Um, so we're still using time as a unit on the x-axis here, and 
um, you know, we have days since the 10th death. Um, but really, given that we have exponential growth in these cases, um, all that really matters to understand that um, is the number of total cases we have and the rate of growth um, uh, or the number of new cases. So time doesn't really matter here. Um, so we could take that kind of off the chart. Um, so I really like this visualization, um, which is going to now show us the new confirmed cases on the y-axis on a log scale plotted against the total confirmed cases, which is going to make the exponential um, growth really obvious. Both are starting at 10. Um, both are log scaled. Um, and here the diagonal is going to represent um, basically exponential growth, where our new cases are proportional to total confirmed cases. And so when a country is moving along the diagonal, they're experiencing exponential growth. Um, as soon as they drop from that diagonal, um, it means they, they've uh, gotten out of that, that growth, uh, exponential growth rate. And so what I like here is that um, I see something that I see, I think, a lot in visualizations that are really nice is that we've kind of reduced the visual judgment to looking for deviation from some symmetry that the graph sets up. So here we're just looking for deviation um, kind of from the line. Um, OK, so I've been talking a lot about different ways of thinking about the salience of data in a visualization and how you know different ways of visualizing it can change kind of the implied importance or the, the impact. Um, but I want to end with a point about the salience of visualization itself and how um, it can be a bit dangerous in the absence of kind of good uncertainty communication. Um, so the idea here is that, you know, not only is our eye drawn to, to data that's more extreme in a graph, but simply by graphing data, I think we kind of convey importance to it and sometimes imply that there's more kind of precision data than perhaps there is. Um, so for many people who don't work with data, I think seeing a graph um, of something like model epitome of science. And so they might trust it, um, but I think this is dangerous. Um, so uh, one of the reasons it's dangerous is that many of the most, I think, compelling COVID visualizations are presenting model estimates, like predictions of different simulations, um, you know, for what will happen in terms of COVID severity under different conditions. And, you know, these visualizations can be dangerous if we take them at face value, um, or if we read them as being more precise than they are, because um, in reality, there's a fair amount of uncertainty. So um, here you've probably seen this flatten the curve visualization. Um, uh, you know, often with something like this, we have issues with the input data, which I've already kind of talked about, but we also have issues with the assumptions being made um, to make these predictions. So we have some sort of model and it's making assumptions about the world and how COVID kind of grows. Um, we're not necessarily seeing those assumptions when we see the model predictions. Um, so, you know, I would ask yourself with something like this, do you understand the model that produced it? And do you know if it's a good representation of reality or how COVID actually grows? And most of the time, you know, probably not. I don't, I'm not an epidemiologist, um, but I know that there's likely to be these assumptions. Um, and, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, like I said, the input data is bad, but things like um, estimates of rates of severity um, can make visualizations like this kind of overestimate severity or underestimate it depending in this particular case, I was kind of floored when I read that the author of this visualization really just kind of sketched this dotted line um, sort of as his guess of the healthcare system capacity. Um, so, you know, there's been um, uh, edits suggested by people with more knowledge about where that line should actually be, but it's a great example of how um, there's an assumption here um, and a lot of uncertainty. Um, here's another example. This is a visualization of uh, simulation model results um, from the New York Times estimating how many COVID infections we'll see at different points in the future. And what's nice um, in some ways is that I can play with it as a reader and I have all of these different parameters I can tweak with these sliders. Um, and so, you know, this can be good in that it, it helps me understand how different um, parameter values that go into a model affect its predictions. I can kind of develop an awareness here. Um, uh, about how much, you know, initial conditions or values that are set um, can do to predictions. But I also think it's easy with something like this to think, oh, this is comprehensive. They're, they've thought of everything because they have all, so many parameters here. Um, but there is, you know, still this other type of uncertainty um, about, you know, how good is the, the, the model that's been chosen, the way that these parameters are, are sort of put in combination to make predictions. There's also a third type of uncertainty we're not seeing, um, you know, presumably at each point on this X axis, um, we should actually see, whoops, it comes back a distribution, but we're really just seeing a single point anywhere on the X axis. And so we're not seeing kind of 
um, a distribution of, of, of results representing different possible values that, that the model says are important. So to kind of close, um, we can summarize the ways in which presenting uncertainty, I think, can mislead um, as this difference between what an economist would call risk, um, or I like to think of as small wor world uncertainty. So risk you can think of as you know, somebody um, sort of assuming their model is right and their model is able to predict multiple possible outcomes. So rather than seeing a single point, I should see a distribution um, at any point on that previous um, uh, simulation. But on the other hand, we have this large world on, uh, uncertainty or um, often just uncertainty for economists. And this is my inability to say exactly how good my model is. You know, I can't really quantify this. Maybe I can say which of two models I think are, are more realistic, but it's very hard to put a number on this kind of thing. And so we can't visualize it really. Um, uh, or Matt may talk more about different ways to get around this, but for the most part, we can't visualize it. All we can do is kind of be very clear about what are my model's assumptions. Um, so um, to, to close kind of what I think is dangerous in particular about this is that if it turns out that any of these models are wrong and they probably will be, because um, as you know, famous statisticians have said, all models are wrong. Um, on some level, they're never going to predict reality exactly. Um, what can happen is that because we haven't been very straightforward about the uncertainty, all the assumptions, and even the uncertainty in the sort of small world sense, people may then not trust future data-driven decision-making, not trust science as much um, when they realize that, oh, maybe these models overestimated severity, or maybe these models underestimated severity. So that really scares me as a visualization researcher. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Matt now, and I think he's going to kind of continue um, on some of these points and introduce some new ones. Uh, let me find my WebEx. Where do I stop sharing my screen? That's good. I got it. Uh, okay, is this working well? Can you see the screen and hear me? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, so yeah, uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm going to kind of pick up where a little bit where Jessica left off, especially talking about uh, precision uh, or over precision in visualizations, ways we can try to represent uncertainty um, in ways that people can understand. Basically, I'm going to go through a couple of examples of things visualizations both from COVID and not, and also sketch out a couple of ideas for um, approaches that maybe haven't been adopted yet that could be applied to this type of data. Um, so I'm actually going to start with a different kind of uh, predictive model um, that uh, you know we actually know the outcome of. Um, so here are probabilistic predictions of Trump's chance of winning the 2016 presidential election from three different poll aggregators. Um, so 538 gave him about a 28% chance, New York Times 15, and Huffington Post a 2% chance. Um, I think the interesting thing about these predictions is even this many years later, uh, people still complain about, uh, say, the quality of 538's prediction here. Um, but the thing is, one way of judging the quality of that prediction might be, um, you know, over time, over all the predictions that 538 makes, when they say something has a third of a chance of happening, does it happen a third of the time? Um, and if, if in this case they say it has a third of a chance of happening, we shouldn't actually be too surprised uh, if Trump wins. I think the problem here is not um, the the prediction that's being made so much as the way it's being communicated. Uh, so I'm going to show a, a sort of alternative way of presenting the same information. This is something called a risk communication theater. So the story here is that I've given you a ticket to a random seat in this theater. Uh, I've colored the seats black in proportion to Trump's chance of winning the election. Uh, if you end up in a black seat, uh, Trump wins. If you end up in a white seat, uh, Clinton wins. So I think you hopefully will agree with me that in, the, in this representation, say for the 538 prediction, you actually wouldn't be too surprised to end up in a black seat um, and probably less surprised than when I just told you there was a 28% chance without showing you the visual. Now the point here is that people are very good at ignoring uncertainty, but this is especially true when we provide bad uncertainty representations. And so it's incumbent upon us as communicators to do a better job at this. Risk communication theaters are just examples of icon arrays that are already used in medical risk communication. And more broadly, we think about these as frequency framing or discrete outcome visualizations of uncertainty. Um, there was actually a, another interesting example in a, in a similar sort of vein uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, video. Oh, there we go. Um, so this is, uh, 
this is a uh, sort of walkthrough animated video of all of the gun deaths in America from a 538 piece from a couple of years ago, talking about the different causes. Uh, I think besides the the evidence that we have that these sort of frequency framing representations make people allow people to better reason under uncertainty, um, I think they also provide an emotional impact when you see something like this, when you're seeing all of these cases at once. Um, and so one of the questions I had was, can we apply this to this uh, to this flatten the curve uh, sort of idea, right? Um, so here's one of the examples of these. I, I'm sure you've all seen them. Um, this is a, this is a particularly nice one for reasons I'll talk about later, uh, or at least there's aspects of this that I like. Um, I'm not going to get into those details until in a couple of minutes, but one of the things to just point out here, in case you haven't seen this before, so the red line is essentially the presumed uh, sort of the, the predicted uh, necessary hospital capacity, assuming we do nothing. The orange line is the hospital capacity we need on any given day, assuming we do something, uh, so with some intervention. And then this gray dotted line at the bottom is our actual hospital capacity. Uh, I think these visualizations have been really nice, at least the, the notion of flatten the curve uh, as, a, as a sort of uh, almost rhetorical device in sort of spreading out into our our sort of public consciousness has has been a really powerful idea. Um, it's sort of a, a pithy uh, thing. I think one of the problems, though, is that um, the the abstraction of this visualization actually loses some of the weight of what we're really talking about, that these are people. Um, and so what I was thinking about was, can you take this icon array idea and the, and the flat the curve idea and combine them? And uh, Actually, what you end up with is something called a dot plot, and this is something that uh, we've been studying for, for the past couple of years, sort of the properties of these types of representations. Um, and so I just mocked up something, and this is based on hypothetical data. So please don't go off tweeting this and like thinking that this is a real model, um, which again, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute anyway. Um, but the idea here is to actually show um, each of these dots is 10,000 people who actually need a bed on that day. Um, which, by the way, looks like that. Um, and if they're above this capacity line, they don't have a bet on that day. If they're below the capacity line, they do have a bet on that day. The idea is to try to help you really reason about the fact that this is affecting real people. Um, there's another sort of side thing to all of these flat in the curve visualizations that I, I, I think is useful to mention here, which is that which is abstracted away both in this representation because I don't have a great solution for it yet, and also in the sort of curve representations, especially when the area is filled in, um, which is that the area under this curve is not actually a total number of people. Uh, it's a total number of beds, bed days, essentially, right? But a single person is going to occupy a bed for multiple days. Uh, so within a given column, you can say, yes, this is giving me an estimate of uh, the number of people uh, who need a bed on that day. But the area under here is not actually like, 4,000 people plus a little less than 4,000 people plus, you know, of whatever this is, 200 and some odd thousand people. That's not the total number of people because you, a single person is going to occupy a bed for multiple days. So there's some other aspects of this visualization that are kind of glossed over in the way that it's shown. Um, that if you really try to dig in and understand what's going on, uh, you, there are certain estimates you could make from this that would be misleading uh, to make you think that this is suggesting an even larger number of people. I don't really have a great solution for that as a, like what visualization you would use to do that. Maybe you turn these uh, into almost more like lozenges showing like the, the amount of time that a person has actually spent uh, in the hospital or something like that. I think it'd be really interesting to try to mock up ways of solving that problem. Um, I think there's also this other thing, well, frequency framing and animation go, at, go hand in hand. Uh, so uh, from a couple of years ago, there was, there was a nice piece from The Guardian that was trying to show the impact of different uh, vaccination rates on um, measles susceptibility in populations. Uh, so here we're seeing a little simulation that's simulating a measles outbreak in, in uh, populations with different uh, vaccination rates. So you can see that number uh, there. There's another nice thing that they've done here, which is they've actually labeled real places that have those vaccination rates. Um, and then also when this thing runs, you can, you can click a button and run it again. You'll get a different outcome every time you run it. So it's allowing you to actually experience uncertainty. And then it's giving you some way of connecting that back to um, real world places to try to understand almost the magnitude of this problem. 
Um, so really animation helps people experience uncertainty. And we've seen a couple of examples of this in the coronavirus cases. So uh, here's the Washington Post coronavirus simulator. Um, this is showing these kind of uh, uh, process models for how people, how experts like simulate um, uh, infectious disease outbreaks. Um, and it's trying to give the reader some kind of notion of how these models work and then what those uh, assumptions have for implications on, on what they predict. So it runs through a couple of different examples. So uh, here's an example um, where it's assuming some kind of quarantining. Um, I won't play all of these all the way through uh, just for time. There's another example where uh, it's assuming some kind of uh, self-isolating, I think was this one. Um, and then showing you the implications of that. And, and when, the, when it ends, you can rerun it. So you can, with a little bit of work, um, and I think this is maybe a little bit of part of the issue that I, I still see with these visualizations, with a little bit of work, if you rerun the simulation a couple of times, you can start to get a sense of the variance or, or, or that, that predictive uncertainty um, contingent upon those model assumptions. And that's really where, where Jessica was sort of leaving off at the end of her part of the presentation, this notion of small world and large world uncertainty. All of these things uh, are contingent upon model assumptions. Uh, if you really want to dig into it, so there's another nice example of this same sort of model from Three Blue One Brown, where they really start digging into like what are other ways we can set up these models? How can we uh, simulate things like different cities or uh, grocery stores or uh, you know different forms of self isolation um, and see what kind of impact that has on um, the the predictions? This takes, I think, a lot of work. You, you have to explicitly do it. I think you can't rely on a reader necessarily to just, um, you know, tweak some parameters or uh, rerun a simulation a couple of times. I think you, you, you really need to be upfront about those assumptions and then try to guide people through uh, their implications. Um, but I want to come back to just conceptually, what is this notion of large world versus small world uncertainty? Um, as Jessica was saying, economists like to call this risk versus uncertainty. I absolutely loathe that terminology. I wish that it had never come into existence. Uh, I think risk means something colloquially quite different from what economists mean when they say the word risk. So I tend to use this uh, small world, which they would call risk, and large world, which they, they would call uncertainty terminology. Um, so out there somewhere, we have reality. Uh, we want to learn something about reality or predict something about reality. Uh, so we set up some model. The understanding of that model is necessarily less than the entirety of reality. If we're talking about something like COVID, we aren't going to simulate everyone in America or everyone in the world. We don't know everything about those people. We don't know everything about their social networks or where they go. Uh, so we have to simplify, right? Our model makes some prediction, uh, perhaps, and that prediction ideally has some uncertainty associated with it. Uh, so you can imagine this circle inscribing different possible outcomes that we could have in terms of things like death rates or uh, number of infected and so on. Um, and then uh, we have the way the world actually works, right? There's some true data generating process, uh, which we might call the technical term for this, but really we can just think about this as how COVID actually works. Um, but of course, how COVID actually works is not going to be inside of our model. It's going to be somewhere out there in the world. It's more complex than our model can understand. But our hope is that the small world of the model is a good approximation to the large world, so that these things are close together. But we don't know if they're close together. We, in fact, don't know where this is at all. Um, and so uh, this is where that problem of large world uncertainty really comes in. Um, how good is our approximation of the small world to the large world? Uh, how good are our predictions going to be? Uh, are we going to be somewhere over here where the approximation works pretty well? Are we going to be somewhere over here where it doesn't? Um, I think this is where you often want to turn to um, domain knowledge and, and expert knowledge to assess the, the quality of the assumptions that go into different models, the, the implications of the simplifications, if you will. Um, so if we go back to uh, this example uh, from Allison Hill um, that I was talking about a little bit earlier, I, I want to sort of illustrate where large and small world uncertainty actually pop up in these sorts of things. So, so this one's kind of interesting if you uh, open it up, um, which I'll try to show really quickly. You don't really need to pay too much attention to what's going on here. Um, so th this is uh, where I got that screenshot from. You can tweak all of these parameters at the left. It will update the chart on the right. Um, there's also a about page that talks about um, 
sort of the people involved, other recommended models, which I think is nice because you're talking about other other ways to look at the same data. Um, you've got a page on how this thing actually works. Um, so I think there's a lot of nice detail here. I wouldn't necessarily call this a, a way that you would communicate to the public. This is more, I think, for an expert audience. Um, but the other thing that's going on here is there's this disclaimer at the top that basically says, don't use this for decision making, um, which is nice. I mean, I think, I think this is an example of people who are thinking really hard about this problem and then trying to be humble about the, the applicability of the simulations that they're, they're running. Um, and this is what I would call, you know, one of the ways we deal with large world uncertainty is being upfront about assumptions um, and being clear about how you think something should or should not be applied. Um, now, by contrast, here's a, a quite different model. So this is a very different type of model. This is actually a, a regression model. Um, so this is essentially doing curve fitting. The previous model is a process model. It's actually simulating some dynamics about how um, disease spreads. Um, this particular example has essentially no disclaimers attached to it. Uh, you can find the paper and like read into it and read about the model details, but it's presented this way um, without sort of any notion of large world uncertainty. It has, which the other model does not. So one thing I do like about this visual presentation is it's small, it has small world uncertainty. It has some kind of uncertainty interval, uh, although it doesn't say what type. So I'm not actually sure uh, what this interval means. Um, it would be nice if that was labeled in some way. Uh, but we do have small world uncertainty. So then you might ask, well, OK, they have small world, world uncertainty. Like, that's good, right? Well, if you look at the scales on these axes, um, any small world uncertainty in either of these models is currently just swamped by the fact that this one is predicting things on the order of millions, uh, tens of millions, and this one is predicting things on the order of hundreds of thousands. Um, and so if you're trying to come to some conclusion on the basis of these two models, you can't just say, well, I'm going to pick the one that I like the best. Uh, there is a sort of infamous clip from uh, one of those like morning news programs uh, from many years ago where uh, the, the hosts were talking about, uh, oh, you know, if you go and look into the medical literature, like, it tells you that everything gives you cancer. So what I do is I just, you know, pick whatever papers tell me I can eat the things I like to eat and then just go with it. Uh, that's obviously a terrible way of making decisions under large world uncertainty. Um, what you might do here is actually sort of try to understand something about what the experts are telling you about what sorts of assumptions go into these models. Um, you could get uh, domain experts to give qualitative assessments of the um, quality of a model or the way that it might break. Um, the one on the right, for example, the, the way the model is set up, it actually has no way of predicting a second wave outbreak. Um, it's just a limitation of the model type that they've chosen. So it's it, it, like you, you can get sort of a, a domain expert's view of um, how well these things might match up to reality and how much you might want to trust them. Um, so leaving that stuff aside for a second, uh, I just kind of want to finish uh, with hypothetical outcome plots again, which which Jessica mentioned earlier on. Um, so one of the things that I did with the uh, this uh, Allison Hills uh, model um, was essentially just tweak the parameters um, just to simulate what a hypothetical outcome plot might look with like with this thing. Um, so so thinking uh, so sorry before I get there, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how that looks in general on on uh, uncertainty in, in model uh, curves. Uh, so here's a typical example, like a, a, a linear model. Um, often you see these uncertainty bands. So you saw one just a minute ago in that one uh, COVID model uh, I was just talking about. Uh, you can do different things though. You can, you can take say uh, many plausible uh, or possible um, lines predicted by a model and, and plot those, or you can even do this hypothetical outcome approach where you might show um, just one at a time and sort of animate over so that people can experience that uncertainty. Um, I think this type of re representation can be potentially powerful. Um, you know, you can say things like, if I stop on a random frame, how much do you want to bet that and the outcome is going to look the way you want? want. Um, so you can apply the same sort of approach to these curve visualizations. So if I go back to that uh, model from Alice Hill, uh, here is uh, me just sort of mocking up what a hops version of that might look like. If I had a little bit more time, uh, you know, I might have done things like try to make the axis fixed. Um, but you can see, so it's giving us some of these parameters in terms of uh, telling us uh, properties of how uh, quickly the um, the disease might spread, and then shows us sort of these 
different possible worlds that we might have um, given different assumptions going into the model. Now, this still doesn't really take care of large world uncertainty. You might try to do this where you also animate over different reasonable models. Like you don't want to just pick any old model, um, but you might say take a bunch of different models that experts have developed um, that you know are considered to be reasonable and try to show the the differences uh, in the ways that those models predict um, reality. Uh, thanks. So I think I'm just going to end there. So I should stop my screen share. Um, yeah, if I could share my screen, I just have a, a slide of some resources, like visualization resources. Um, like so. Um, Maybe we can leave that on while we uh, do the Q and A. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, these are just some things like writings that I've seen that are really good advice on visualizing COVID, um, and then just links to more general stuff by me and Matt on uncertainty visualization research. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that, that was um, super informative. Um, um, we had a, a a good number of questions, and I, I want to. Uh, maybe start with um, a few that um, sort of take a step back from the visualization sort of question and, and the, the uncertainty and, and sort of hear about uh, why do we visualize and what is sort of the, the goal or the purpose of the, the, the communication. So, for example, um, is it to be as accurate as possible about the model or the, the data um, or is there um, a uh, role for visualization to convince people to take action, to you know, stay at home, to be cautious. Um, and uh, does that affect the way you would you would visualize it um, when um, it, it's maybe more about um, getting people to do things um, uh, versus have a have a full and accurate understanding of of what the situation is? Yeah, so I could answer that one just because um, that was one of the points I was I was trying to make with the log versus linear scale chart. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's one of the questions about visualization in in general and and how we should think about it. That's like most prevalent in in what I see with COVID. So, but one example was this log scale thing where I think um, you know if you make a choice to show it on a linear scale, there's it just has more of an impact. Like it makes me take it more seriously. If you show it on a log scale. I can compare better. Um, my my visual comparisons are more accurate, and so I think there. I think that question is coming up a lot with visualizations, um, and I think like some of the stuff Matt showed are also flatten the curve, which we both talked about, um, and some of the like simulation stuff Matt showed is it's kind of um, you know are we trying to get across like um, sort of like a, a mechanism um, or a way of thinking, um, or are we trying to actually present really accurate information. So I think some of these simulations of like how Corona spreads, et cetera, like the really simple ones are sometimes super effective, more at like having an impact and, and helping us understand like, this is what, you know, contagion looks like, um, or this is what exponential growth looks like. But um, I think like it, what becomes particularly tricky is like, it's hard as a viewer to know when you're looking at one versus the other. Um, uh, you know, like, how seriously should I take this particular data or is it more just, um, you know, the, the sort of trend, the way the trend looks itself that's, that's important. Yeah, and I think I would add that, that some of these examples, like the things like the uh, uh, icon arrays or the dot plots, um, I think one of, the, one of the ways in which they can be useful is for persuasion by uh, lending a little bit more visual weight to you know, the fact that there are actually people involved with this. Um, and uh, so I, I think I think that's another thing that goes into it, right? Like you're you're trying to figure out both a representation that is um, accurate, but also one maybe that is that pushes people towards action in some direction. Now I think there, there's a sometimes a false notion that that visualizations are uh, or can be unbiased. I think um, whatever representation you choose is going to have some properties that push people towards some sort of understanding or another, um, or some sort of action or another. And as a designer, you you are either uh, sort of 
throwing up your hands and not making that decision. And so, and the, the decision is made for you implicitly by whatever uh, visualization you choose, um, or you're deliberately making some choice. But I think that the idea that there could be an unbiased visualization of some data uh, is um, sort of denies what we know about human perception. <laughs> so true. Um, this is maybe a good segue. There's um, this one follow-up question, and that is, um, uh, is there a way to visualize um, that would uh, parse out the differences between uncertainty that comes from the data itself, um, where the data is incomplete or the sample is small, versus um, uncertainty that comes from the assumptions of the model that generates it, um, versus uncertainty, for example, that comes from simply predicting the future that we, we, we don't know, um, because it seemed um, that you know, oftentimes those are conflated in, in terms of how it's represented. Yeah, I think, Matt, do you want to take it? Because you were showing kind of more examples of this, like with the yeah. hops of model. Yeah, and so so this is something that we've been talking about internally, I think, for a little, for a while and haven't come up with good solutions to yet, but we have, you know, conjectures about things you could do. I think part of the issues is, Part of the issue is when you try to do that, things become very complex, often uh, visually uh, to understand. So, like one thing you could do, as, as a simple example, right, is say you had one of those visualizations that had um, uh, uh, the like uh, prediction bands around uh, where the curve is, um, and then that's giving, say, your predictive uncertainty within the small world of a given model. Um, and then you might use something like hops or animation to show. Um, this sort of uh, large world uncertainty in many different plausible uh, model types for some problem. Um, now, the, part of the question is, we have no idea how people would uh, make judgments or decisions if they were shown a chart that, that, that is that complex, um, that you know is showing both a large world and, and small world uncertainty simultaneously. I, I know of no empirical studies that uh, use like an animation encoding for one and a, a, like a ribbon encoding for the other and then like evaluate anything about how people make decisions. So we could have some like designerly instinctual say some things about it, but I, I don't really know what would happen. <laughs> um, so Jessica, what did you think about that? <laughs> no, I think that's like a good point. Yeah, I think it's... Um... I mean, I think even there's still things that are hidden too, I guess, um, like if you're showing like different model um, kind of uh, animating different frames and these are predictions coming from different models. So the ribbons are moving around. Um, you know, I think part of the problem is that um, people might make their decisions or whatever based kind of all on the visual information and what they should also be taking into account is like what exactly were the assumptions, you know, of these different models, like how much do I Think that this is a reasonable assumption that like you know human behavior is a fixed thing or whatever so so i think it's um i imagine i mean there is an interesting question of like what is what do you find just from like combining these things we have no idea um, as matt said but then there's also like how do you have like yeah, stuff that you just can't visualize like the assumptions with these other representations that might be visual and like how does it all come together um you know there's uh there's a lot of questions but i think we need to be trying um, so the, it, it seems that um, you know uh, many sort of government officials and policymakers um, reference um, those models as a way to inform um, you know pretty substantial decision making in the in the present situation. Um, and you mentioned a lot of the dangers and the assumptions. Um, are, are there some that are better or worse um, that you have seen that are either based on better data or better assumptions that have been used? Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> this, is where, <laughs> this is where, yeah, our lack of um, medical knowledge <laughs> becomes dangerous. Um, Matt, do you have thoughts on that? I'm trying to I think mean, of what I've liked. Well, one related question, and, and maybe just to put some context on that, um, is um, the models that we see are the models of um, COVID-19 and the associated dynamics, but they, they don't incorporate um, 
the sort of social outcomes, the economic effects, and and right. so the it's a partial visualization of some things um, versus others. Right. Yeah. No. I guess one thing that comes to mind. I haven't spent um, a lot of time on it, but I think there's a site that's collecting a lot of different visualizations, at least so you can kind of browse through a bunch of these different outcomes. Um, I think it's called Our World in Data. Um, but I, yeah. I've thought about that a lot is like, um, you know, nobody's really modeling everything. And so you really have to be trying to look at the, the visualizations predicting, you know, the economic downturn alongside visualizations of like the hospitalization kind of, you know, overwhelm, et cetera. So, um, so I, I don't, maybe Matt knows of other. Uh, I, I like the our world and data one. I mean, I think we had this conversation before uh, we, we put our, slides together for this where you know neither of us is an epidemiologist and i think we're really trying to comment on the the visual representations more than the the quality of the models because that's not our, our expertise right and the, yeah and the uncertainty communication in general yeah. without saying which model we think is is right <laughs> fair enough um, you're not going to tell the epidemiologists what to do um, <laughs> as as i want um, to. Is there, is there any sort of, because um, you opened the talk with the translation of data into visual, are there circumstances or situations where you would not want to visualize and use other ways to communicate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I did see, so there's some recent research out of this, I think it's called the Winston Center for Risk. Um, David Spiegelhalter, who's kind of a famous scientist, runs this center that really looks at like communicating risk. And some of the researchers there, Anne Marth, Vanderblay, Alexandra Freedom, Freeman, and some other people did a study where they basically looked at like what happens if you show um, kind of like in a mock news article context where you have like a data-driven news article, like you communicate uncertainty just qualitatively in text, like you say, here's a number, but it's kind of uncertain versus you give a numerical representation of the uncertainty, like here's a number and here's an interval, or you graphically show that I think they looked at. And one of the things that was surprising there is that people's, um, people's reaction, like in terms of being more cautious with the data and thinking it was more uncertain was strongest when it was just a qualitative expression in text, so like this data is uncertain. Um, which surprised me because I think as a visualization person, it's like, oh, we always have to like make it more precise and be accurate, like give more information. Um, I think in that setting, like it was kind of like a mock news article. And I think they actually did a study on, on the BBC website at some point too. But I think in that setting, it's like, you're looking like when you're reading the news, you're looking to the author of the piece to kind of um, like what they think is important is, is going to shape what you think is an important. And so I think in, in some cases, perhaps um, a narrative format, just kind of saying, you know, like this has a lot of assumptions, et cetera. Um, like Matt had a kind of nice example, um, I think, uh, in his slides. But um, in some cases, I think leading with, um, you know, just the notion that there is a lot of uncertainty in text um, could be useful. So I don't know that I would say we would not still give visual representations, um, but. I mean, I, I guess there is a danger if you don't think your audience is capable of really acknowledging the assumptions, et cetera, or if you don't have text space to put those, then, then I would not visualize, I guess. Yeah, I, I think the, to add, I think the quality, when you have experts basically telling you the qualitative uncertainty here is so high that we don't trust anything, um, it's probably it might be a good idea not to visualize something if it's going to give a false sense of precision. Right. Um, we have a few more more sort of specific questions too. Uh, one is about um, um, how you would um, convey nonlinearity and sort of the, the idea that um, it, it it sort of um, sort of at the edge of chaos or you know sort of where it's a very different game. Yeah, I think, I mean, most of what comes to mind for me are the log scaled axes, like the, the thing that I showed, Matt, um, your thoughts on that? The... Uh, you had that other example that I think maybe you cut from the slides of the, the branching. Oh yeah, I think I still probably um, have it in a backup slide. Let me see, oops, I think I just ended my screen share, but. No, it's still there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't watch too closely. Um, yeah, maybe I did cut that. I have so many backup slides. Oh, this one. Yeah. Let's see. 
Um, yeah, I think, yeah, so maybe these, like Matt and I were talking about how these kind of simpler, like, um, demonstrations can be really powerful. So this one is basically like, here's what this spread can look like. It just kind of takes over. And then here's what happens when, you know, this node in the graph works from home, et cetera. Um, so uh, this is assuming kind of a branching model or whatever. Um, but I think these kind of simpler, like we're just illustrating through animation, kind of the idea. Um, is most of what I've seen that really try to get at that aspect besides like logs, um, besides just showing the exponential growth rate, I guess, not yeah. log scaling, yeah. I should say. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a question about the, the dot plots that you, uh, that you showed, uh, Matthew, and sort of why the number of deads increase in it. Is that? Oh, uh, so I think that's my understanding of that because I was just taking that data from a different model. But I think uh, essentially there's an assumption of some policy changes that cause us to, you know, build more hospital capacity over the course of the outbreak. So that's why the number of beds increases. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, maybe maybe as a as a final question, um, uh, are there some guidelines for governments, journalists, other people that work with data and represent it for best practices or, or good visualization, or is it a free for all? It's definitely not a free for all. Um, people like us do a lot of visualization research um, precisely to come up with these guidelines. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of good um, books out there. Um, so, uh, I mean, it depends on whether you want to kind of just like get more familiar with visualization and visualization techniques, or you're more focused on like communicating kind of the uncertainty part, but um, there's good visualization books like Tamara Munzner, who's kind of um, more senior in our field, wrote a book called Visualization Analysis and Design. Um, uh, there's been books by um, people like Cleveland, who did a lot of this original, I think he was a statistician, he did a lot of original books um, or a little original work on kind of graphical perception. I think his book is called like the elements of graphing data. I think where we see less books is um, concerning kind of like the, the aspect of, of conveying the uncertainty visually. So there's books on communicating uncertainty by people who study like science communication. Um, but in, when it comes to like persuasive aspects of visualization or how to like change minds and influence decisions, I think there's less books. One that comes to mind maybe is Alberto Cairo, um, is a, a relatively well-known author of a lot of visualization books, and his latest is called, I think, How Charts Lie. And that um, is a pretty good, I think, synopsis of sort of ways that visualizations can mislead um, that are, are obviously important to keep in mind if you're trying to influence decision or policy. Um, maybe Matt has other ideas. <laughs> I think that's fine. Um, okay. um, I think we want to, so uh, again, uh, thank you so much, Jessica and Matt. I think we want to uh, bring it to an end and uh, finish on time. Uh, so thank you again uh, for the two of you um, for a very informative webinar and thanks for everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we will continue next uh, week uh, with uh, the next event in, in our series. Um, and for all the participants, um, you can uh, expect to receive a, a, a link with the survey where we hope you will share feedback about um, this one and help us improve future events. Um, so be well, everyone, stay healthy and um, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks.